Welcome again to another episode of Bigfoot for Breakfast. We appreciate you joining us over and over for your weekly dose of creepy here at the home of the mysterious and the macabre where we sit in the studio every week challenging conventional thought. We are your hosts, Sarah Jones and Samantha Carter. Make sure to hit that subscribe button on whichever app you listen from and don't forget to leave a rating and a review. Those really help out the show. We really appreciate it. Hit us up on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter and make sure you check out our website www.bigfootforbreakfast.com. Those are just a few of the ways that you can get to know us better or contact us. You can also send us an email at bigfootforbreakfast at outlook.com or leave us a voicemail or text us at 641-812-2635. Speaking of text messages, we have a few that we want to shout out from last week. We got one from Celia in Williamsburg, Virginia. She said, hey ladies, love the show. She had a question about the tones and the recording in our intro music. She wanted to know if it was from a music tutorial and just kind of wanted to know the story behind it. The intro music is actually from a Cold War numbers station. We do have an episode coming up about that, probably the near future. But basically the story is that there's several numbers stations still running from the Cold War and it's kind of a mystery as to why or there's a lot of speculation as to why. So it's kind of a creepy subject and we chose to use one of those numbers stations tones called the Lincolnshire Poacher. So thank you very much for contacting us, Celia, and thank you for listening. We also got another text regarding the fact that we need a merchandise shop. We just want to let you guys know that we will actually have our merchandise shop up and running in the next few days. So it's up to you guys if you want to go check it out. It'll be on our website and it'll also be on our Facebook, probably our Twitter and Instagram. I don't know. I don't do Twitter and Instagram because I don't know how. Samantha, do you want to weigh in? We'll share it on those things. I will also put it on our TikTok, which I am obsessed with also, so check that out too. We'll have things like coffee cups, tumblers, water bottles that are really neat, obviously hoodies, tank tops, whatever you guys want. We also got another message from a new Patreon subscriber, Buffy. We just want to give a shout out to Buffy. She is from Montana. She actually had a show suggestion for us that was really interesting. I had never heard of before, so we'll be looking into that for a future topic as well. They have kind of a little monster situation going on up in Montana that I had no idea existed. We'll be right there. (laughs) Yeah, we'll come swim. Bring coffee. Yes, bring coffee. (laughs) We love coffee. We pretty much run on coffee and small amounts of oxygen. And that's it. She's been listening to the Ruby Ridge series and that's what got her hooked. So recommend it to your friends, everybody. We want to say thank you so much to Buffy for becoming a new Patreon subscriber. That is really helpful. We really haven't put the Patreon out too much, but it really does help the show so much. Obviously, it costs a little money to run a podcast and we don't make any. So thank you so much for that. I'm just a poor boy. On the Chipper Chick note, check out the link to their Facebook on our Facebook. Get some Nom Nom Coffee, and thank you again for Buffy and Jaden for being listeners and supporting our podcast. I didn't say before, but Chipper Chick is actually the name of their coffee company. Montana. She makes a difference in everyone's day with her coffee and her smile. Yes. So yeah, once again, thank you for joining us for a brand new year of strange stories from history as we explore mystery, abductions, alien encounters, UFOs, cryptids, conspiracy, and everything beyond and in between. With the result of the American election being shrouded in conspiracy and controversy, we've decided to dedicate January of 2021 to a podcast series, which is also fraught with controversy and conspiracy, which are definitely a few of our favorite things. You know, when the dog bites, the bee stings, and we're feeling sad. So the topic of the month is the Camelot era. Joseph of Arimathea, who, according to the Bible, donated his tomb for the burial of Jesus, is where the story of Camelot begins. Really? That far back, is it? I'm learning as well. It was the richest of the Saracen cities in Great Britain, and it was so important that the pagan kings were crowned there, and its mosque was larger and taller than in any other city. Joseph succeeded in converting more than 1,000 of his inhabitants to Christianity. Its king, A leader named Agristus, who is described as being the cruelest man in the world, falsely converted. Dun dun dun! Infiltrator. After Joseph leaves, Agristus persecutes the Christians, eventually going completely mad and throwing himself into a fire. 
Burn them all! Joseph then returns and sees that Camelot has converted to Christianity. In the middle of the city, he had the Church of St. Stephen, the martyr, built. Camelot was described as a city surrounded by forests and meadows, a rich and well-provided town, but offers few details as to its layout or exact size. Geoffrey of Monmouth's 1138 Historia Regium Britanniae, where Arthur first appeared, he is an undoubted hero in a story of magic and dragons wielding his sword named Caliburn and a lance named Ron. Arthur is a warrior and a leader in a league of his own, regarded as, quote, a youth of such unparalleled courage and generosity joined with that sweetness of temper and innate goodness as gained him universal love, end quote. Obviously, as time went on and the tale was told by other authors with their own twists, the stories changed in many ways, but kept a lot of the base elements the same. The texts say that Arthur held court in a castle next to a body of water that is said to have been furnished with a main courtyard, bedrooms, areas for feasting, and of course, the infamous round table. It was a wedding gift from Guinevere's father after Arthur asked for her hand in marriage. At the time, there were already a hundred knights out of the total of 150 who were members of the round table, and the magician Merlin was asked to choose the remaining members to bring it to a full complement, emphasizing that each must be chivalrous. When they were assembled, Merlin said, From now on you must love one another and hold one another as dear as brothers. For from the love and sweetness of this table where you will be seated, there will be born in your hearts such a great joy and friendship that you will leave your wives and children to be with one another and spend your youth together. Hmm. According to a translation by Martha Asher, the names of the knights were engraved on their chairs, and by the end of the saga, after the death of King Arthur, nearly every knight of the round table is dead. In the Vulgate cycles, there seem to be two sides to Camelot. On the surface, the leaders of the city are pious. Their king attends mass regularly and makes the sign of the cross when he hears bad news. Chivalry is essential and vespers, a form of evening prayer, are held regularly. At times, battlefield enemies are even buried with honors. Yet some of the most senior people in the city engage in destructive behavior. Some of the stories discuss how Queen Guinevere and Lancelot, the most powerful knight of the realm, engaged in an affair. When King Arthur finds out about this, he finds himself in a ruinous war with Lancelot. At the end of this story, it is not Lancelot who kills Arthur, but the king's own son, Mordred. Entrusted with the kingdom of Logres, while Arthur pursues Lancelot, he takes it over, forcing Arthur to confront him in a final battle. In the final battle, the king attacks Mordred, bearing down on him with all of his force, he struck him so hard that he ripped apart the links of Mordred's hauberk and thrust the steel of his lance through his body. Mordred repays his father in kind. When, quote, Mordred saw the seriousness of his wound, he realized that it would be fatal, and he struck King Arthur so powerfully in the helmet that nothing could protect his head, and the sword cut away part of his skull. Those quotes came from translations by Norris Lacey. Mordred died, and King Arthur would pass away soon afterward. Thus, did the father kill the son, and the son mortally wounded the father. King Arthur, Knights, Camelot, John F. Kennedy. What the hell do they have to do with the other? Why, in modern-day America, do we hear Camelot and think Kennedy? Where did this association with the mythical monarch who brought peace, chivalry, and nobility to his kingdom come from? In the 1950s, 60s, and even 70s in America were marked with the Kennedy name. JFK served in the Massachusetts House of Representatives from 1953 to 1960 and served as the 35th President of the United States from 1961 to 1963 when he met an untimely death that has since been the oak that has sprouted a thousand roots in the form of conspiracy theories that has dominated political whispers even to this day. And we will get to all that. John Fitzgerald Kennedy is only one man in a line of famous Kennedys that are well known for their roles in American history and politics. Today's episode isn't about JFK, alas. While it is the association of his presidency to the principles Arthurian legend that would persuade the public to remember the slain president as a rare and heroic leader, our main story today begins elsewhere, be it in a very similar, less than humble beginning. On February 22nd of the year 1932, in Boston, Massachusetts, the last of the children born to Joseph P. Kennedy Sr. and Rose Elizabeth Fitzgerald was born. Edward Moore Kennedy, who came to be known as Ted, was number nine out of nine children born to the prominent Kennedy family. It is with him, the last born and the last surviving brother, that we begin our daunting trek through what is known as the Camelot era, which sounds so very graceful and enchanting. But, we will also explore what has been speculated as being a curse on the Kennedy family. 
BigThings.com released an interview, which we found on YouTube, and you can find the link in our cited works, in which Ted Kennedy discusses the huge role his family had on his life and his development. Having been the youngest, having to fight to have his point of views heard in such a large group of ambitious men and political leaders. While you could assume his path in the world had been paved before him and his career was handed to him on a silver platter, that probably was not necessarily the reality of the case, but maybe it was a little. I don't know. You're listening to the Prescribed Films Podcast Network, home to hundreds of hours of free podcast entertainment. The shows on this network all have a common goal, providing you with the best discussions about movies and other forms of entertainment media. The PFPN hopes to fill your ear holes with audio joy. Visit our website with links to all the other amazing shows at www.thepfpn.com. Thanks for listening. Ted Kennedy graduated from Harvard University in 1956 and received a law degree from the University of Virginia in 1959. He played his role as the dutiful brother in participating in the election campaigns of his brothers John and Robert, who were both assassinated shortly thereafter. But we're not going to talk about that right now. Early in 1969, Ted himself was elected majority whip in the U.S. Senate and early on, looked to be a strong frontrunner for the next Democratic presidential nomination. While it would be honorable to follow in his brother's footsteps on that front, that Kennedy curse already seemed to be in full swing. Before John and Robert's untimely, politically motivated murders, the oldest Kennedy brother, Joe Jr., had died when his plane exploded over France during the war in 1944. Four months after their wedding, his sister Kathleen's husband was shot through the heart by a German sniper, and Kathleen, nicknamed Kick, was also killed in a plane crash. While he wouldn't be assassinated, he was far from beyond the reach of the curse. On June 19th of 1964, shortly after the United States Senate passed the Civil Rights Act, 32 years young Senator Ted Kennedy was two years into the term he won in a special election, rushed to the airport, and boarded a small chartered plane. He was running late on his way to Springfield, Massachusetts to accept the nomination for a full term in the Senate at the state Democratic Convention, but never made it to Springfield. During the approach, The weather turned murky, and shortly after 11 p.m., the pilot, Zimney, tried to make an approach, flying on instruments alone. Keep in mind the time 11 p.m., for purposes of strange coincidence. Three miles from the runway, the plane flew too low, hit some trees, and crashed into an orchard. The keynote speaker for the Democratic Convention, Senator Birch Bay of Indiana, and his wife, Marvello, who were also aboard the plane, did survive the crash as did Ted Kennedy. Unfortunately, his legislative aide, Edward Moss, and pilot Edwin Zimney did not. After helping his wife from the plane, Senator Bay, who luckily was spared from any serious injury, pulled Kennedy from the wreckage. Ted was less fortunate, suffering three broken vertebrae, two broken ribs, and a collapsed lung. Of the crash in an ABC article that can be found in our work cited, Kennedy recalled, quote, I was watching the altimeter, and I saw it drop from 1,100 feet to 600 feet. It was just like a toboggan ride, right along the tops of the trees for a few seconds, then there was a terrific impact into a tree. Investigators speculated that it may well have been their positions in the plane that determined their survival. The bays had been sitting in the rear of the small plane and sustained only minor injuries. Moss and Zimney were up front while Kennedy had been in the middle of the plane in a rear-facing seat. The injuries he sustained would cause him pain for the remainder of his life, but I wouldn't consider him to have been too unlucky, though, considering. It would be five months in the hospital for his recovery. He would, of course, return to his public life as a political figurehead, and as it turns out, tragically, a few broken bones weren't enough to satiate the Kennedy family curse. On July 18th of 1969, nearly 650 million Americans were cozy in their homes or some other venue, eagerly watching their televisions as updates on the progress of the Apollo 11 lunar landing mission were plastered over the waves. As Apollo 11 launched on July 16th, 1969, carrying Commander Neil Armstrong, Command Module Pilot Michael Collins, and Lunar Module Pilot Edwin Buzz Aldrin into an orbit around the Earth, or put on a damn good show in a Hollywood backlot. You know. Whatever you choose to believe. On that note, I do want to throw in a plug for an upcoming episode in which 
We will be interviewing David Weiss of the Flat Earth Podcast, and we would love if you would submit any questions you have for him. Make sure you do your research on David before you start asking the questions. He is on several interviews throughout the interwebs, so check him out, see what he's got to say, send any questions into us. Back to the subject at hand, though, instead of watching the Apollo 11 take one small step for man and one giant leap for mankind, like every other American, Ted Kennedy, along with his cousin Joe Gargan, were hosting a cookout throwing a party in, at a rented cottage on the Tropaquitic Island. For those who are unfamiliar, Tropaquitic is an affluent island near Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts. The party was intended to be a reunion celebration for members of the last Robert F. Kennedy campaign, which included 28-year-old Mary Jo Kopechny, along with five other women, Rosemary Keough, Esther Newberg, Nance and Mary Ellen Lyons, and Susan Tannenbaum. These five young single ladies, who are lovingly referred to as RFK's boiler room girls, were accompanied at this party by six men, which included Ted Kennedy, his cousin Joe Gargan, Paul Markham, and John B. Crimmins, who was the chauffeur, Charles Tretter, who was a lawyer from Boston, and Raymond LaRosa, who was a civil defense official from Massachusetts. So there's a lot of controversy surrounding this party to begin with, because of the men who were in attendance to the party, all but one was married, while the women were not. It sounds as though the wives of the men had been invited, but supposedly at the last minute, and for various reasons, were unable to attend this reunion of political workers. That in and of itself just screams scandal, especially in a group of politicians. Keep that in mind as we dive into more detail on the events which unfolded on this particular night. It was on the afternoon of July 18th of 1969 that the senator arrived at the airport at Edgartown and was driven by his chauffeur to the two-car ferry which connects Edgartown to Chappaquiddick across a 500-foot harbor channel. Once the ferry lands, it's just a three-mile jaunt down to the only asphalt road in Chappaquiddick to the cottage which had been rented by Mr. Kennedy's cousin, Joseph F. Gargan, for the party. But first, a swim. The senator changed into a pair of swimming trunks and then was driven back down the road about a half a mile, taking a right turn onto unpaved Dyke Road, which leads over Dyke Bridge to a beach on the east side of the island. After a short swim, he was driven back to the cottage to once again change into a new set of trunks before his chauffeur drove him down the main road to the ferry slip where the Kennedy family had sailed in the annual week-long regatta sponsored by the Yacht Club in Edgartown for years prior. After a long afternoon of regatta-ing, he made his way back to Edgartown by around 6 p.m., checking into his room at the Shiretown Inn, but then returning to the cottage on Chappaquiddick, where he took a bath and waited for the party guests to arrive. It sounds like the women who were to attend the party also swam that afternoon at the beach on the east side of the island. The party began around 8.30 p.m., which is a little later than was expected. According to later statements, Mr. Crimmins had fully stocked the bar with three and a half gallons of vodka, four-fifths of scotch, two bottles of rum, and a couple of cases of canned beer for the guests. The small gathering also included a steak dinner as they passed the time reminiscing of campaign days and then dancing and singing as one does at parties. It was just after 11 p.m. Dun, dun, dun. When chauffeur Crimmins began advising that everyone call it a night and head to catch the last ferry before it closed at midnight, Gargan insisted that he had arranged to get a special ferry ride and the guests continued to party on. But Ted spoke privately with his chauffeur at that time to tell him that he wanted to leave because he was tired and wanted to go back to the inn to sleep. Crimmins had planned to stay at the cottage as well as Mr. Markham. Ted asked Crimmins for the keys to the Oldsmobile. And because it was his own car, Crimmins didn't question it. He gave the keys to the senator. Kennedy also told Crimmins that Miss Kopechny, with whom he had just been talking, was also not feeling well from the sun that day and was wanting to go back to the inn. So without saying goodbye to anyone so as not to disrupt the party, the two left shortly after 11 p.m. Mary Jo also didn't tell anyone goodbye or let anyone know that she was leaving. And in spite of her not feeling well and wanting to return to her room, she left without her purse and her hotel key. Hmm, slightly suspicious, Senator. Yes, indeed. Indeed suspicious. So, at the cottage, where I'm guessing there was not a special ferry arrangement for the guests after all, it sounds like the remaining five women and five men were left with one car, four single beds, and a sofa for the ten remaining guests who were to end up spending the night there. 
and a partridge in a pear tree. So Ted and Mary Jo drove off in the black Oldsmobile, supposedly to get a ferry so that they could return to their own hotel rooms. But that is far from where they ended up on that fateful night. The circumstances of the incident are obviously questionable, as there are only two people who really know the truth of what happened, and now they're both dead. But while driving the car down the main roadway recklessly, according to speculation, Kennedy took a sharp turn onto the unpaved dike road, drove for a short distance at possibly a high rate of speed. He missed the ramp to the narrow wooden dike bridge, causing the Black Oldsmobile to go plummeting into the Pouch of Pond. Now, we know for certain that the two of them had been down this road before, literally, not figuratively, as this is where the beach was that they had been swimming earlier that day. Kennedy insisted that the excursion on Dyke Road was a mistaken wrong turn, as it is exactly the opposite direction of the ferry. The fact that they headed off alone, a married senator and an unmarried woman, was the least scandalous part of this situation. After plunging into the water, Kennedy managed to get himself out of the car and up for air. As he tells it, he exhausted many attempts to dive back into the dark murky waters to try to get Mary Jo out of the car, to no avail, so he left and returned to the cottage. Kennedy enlisted Gargan and another of the men to return with him, making another attempt to save Kopechny from the submerged car. The three men, even together, were unsuccessful, unable to get her out of the car and out of the water. The three men then took off and went to the ferry slip, where Kennedy dove into the water and swam back to Edgartown, which was about a mile swim across the way. So one would think this to be the appropriate time for one or the other, or all of these men, maybe, to call the police or rescue of some sort to recover this woman. But that is not what happened here. In fact, Ted returned to his room at the Shiretown Inn and changed his clothes. In what could only be assumed as an attempt at establishing an alibi, at about 2.25 a.m., Kennedy emerged from his room into view of the innkeeper, Russell Peachy. Peachy was told that Ted had been awakened by a noise next door. He then asked what time it was before returning to his room. So this not only ensured that he had someone to corroborate that he was in his room at that time, but it ensured that the innkeeper knew the time. It wasn't until 9.45 a.m. on July 19th, 10 hours after driving off the Dyke Road Bridge, that Kennedy reported the accident to Edgartown Police Chief Dominic Arena. He then admitted that he was the driver. Some sources state that he had an expired license at the time. I also read that while he was filling out the paperwork for the report, he left a blank after the name Mary Jo because he didn't even know her last name. According to, quote, Senatorial Privilege and the Chappaquiddick Cover-Up, written in 1988 by author Leo Damore, an interview with Joe Gargan claims that it had initially been plotted by Kennedy to report that Mary Jo Kopechny had been the driver and that she had been the only occupant of the vehicle at the time of the accident. This is not some panicked kid afraid of getting into trouble. This is an affluent adult male, a state senator with a bid for president of the United States of America, a married man with the death of a woman on his hands making well-thought-out plans to cover up his involvement in what began as an accident and became a crime. He insisted that neither he nor she had been intoxicated at the time. He also denied that there had been anything inappropriate going on between himself and Kopechny. On July 25th, he pled guilty to leaving the scene of an accident and received a two-month suspended sentence. His driver's license was also suspended for a year after delaying the report of an accident that resulted in the death of a woman for 10 hours. He was charged with leaving the scene of an accident. Well, what else could they do? In order to charge Kennedy with involuntary manslaughter, the police would have had to establish that he'd done something illegal like speeding or driving under the influence. And of course, after 10 hours, they couldn't prove if he'd been drunk while driving. They did find, however, that it may have taken several hours underwater, trapped in a car, fighting for survival for Mary Jo Kopechny to die. John Farrar, the captain of the Edgartown Fire Department's Search and Rescue Division, pulled Kopechny from the car. He reported that the car had been sitting in about six feet of water and parts of the roof and trunk appeared to be dry. The rescuers had discovered an air pocket in the vehicle and found Kopechny's body situated in a way that could have allowed her to survive for a period of time. While the medical examiner ruled drowning as the cause of death, as far as Farrar was concerned, it was likely she suffocated as she ran out of breathable air. 
Had the police and rescue been called as soon as the accident occurred, she very well may have been saved. I think from what I read, four hours is how long she was under there alive. So the fact that he couldn't get her out is reasonable, but the fact that he didn't go for help and just left her there. For 10 hours? I'm pretty sure that's what got him in trouble, and now this is his entire legacy, and that's really sad. Bad decisions and such. Remorseful in the public eye, Kennedy did admit that his delay in reporting the accident was indefensible. He made the claim that he was suffering from physical and emotional shock, and that he was not thinking clearly. But was that really the case? That's the question, isn't it? Even if he had been suffering from shock, why didn't his aides who attempted to get her out of the water at the time call the police themselves, or push him to do so? Tests revealed that Kopechny's blood alcohol content resulted at .09, which indicated that she had consumed several drinks. To her friends, however, she was said to have been a woman who typically consumed very little alcohol. For whatever reason, at the time of her recovery, an autopsy had not been done. So many questions go unanswered in this case, and those who knew weren't talking. Being who he was, there was an army of people at his back to help cover it up and smooth it over, including damage control and legal efforts pushed by the likes of ex-defense secretary Robert McNamara and JFK speechwriter Ted Sorensen. In January of 1970, there was an inquest, conducted in secret, to gather facts about the incident. A police officer named Huck Look reported having seen the car that he believed to be Kennedy speeding toward Dyke Bridge around 12.40 a.m., which contradicted Kennedy's timeline and reason for leaving the party. The ferry would have stopped running 40 minutes prior to that, so taking himself and Mary Jo to the ferry to get to their rooms at the inn couldn't have been the reason he was out driving about. Wrong turn? I don't think so. Bob Mola was an investigating officer for the Registry of Motor Vehicles and had been one of the investigators of the accident and remembers Kennedy being unusually calm and collected for the ordeal that he had experienced. According to Mola, it wasn't like a normal person who had been in a fatal accident. It was almost like he was an actor and he had a script to go by. Which, I'm sure, based on the legal team at his back, that's exactly how it was. He had plenty of time to make plenty of phone calls between the time that the accident happened and turning himself in. Plenty of time to coach him on what to say, what to do, and how to act. Mala was subpoenaed to testify at the 1970 inquest to look into the case, but he didn't. In fact, he was escorted from the courtroom after being told he wouldn't be asked any questions about the incident. Farrar was also brought in to testify at the proceedings and brought with him a sketch that he had drawn detailing the manner in which Kopechny was found inside of the car, but the judge didn't allow the presentation or discussion about it. Weird. Not really. It sounds like another case of getting away with murder, so to speak. I mean, technically manslaughter, because you have money and friends in high places. The hush-hush inquest did result in enough probable cause to have charged Kennedy with negligently operating his vehicle, which ultimately contributed directly to Kopechny's death. The district attorney refused to press charges on that front. According to a statement in an interview by Mala, the official word was that Kennedy was being taken care of by the DA, the judge, everybody. The Kopechny family is rumored to have received around $50,000 from the Kennedy's insurance as well as money directly from him. Personally, $90,904, which is $615,061.90 today with inflation to be exact, which yeah, nice gesture. But the way I see it, it speaks a lot to his feeling that he was in fact guilty. Despite evading any serious charges for the incident, Ted Kennedy wasn't ev able to ever entirely wash his hands of this incident. Obviously. And while it might not be a necessarily well-known scandal as far as the general public was or is concerned, it was something that put a wrench in his political career. He was no longer first in line for the nomination by the Democratic National Convention for the upcoming presidential election in 1972 or in 1976. He did leave it up to his constituents to tell him if they wanted him to step down from his political position or if they had it in their hearts to forgive him and support him, clearly seeing as how he didn't leave politics. You know how that whole situation went down. Through this entire discussion thus far, we've managed to not even touch on some of the other repercussions of this particular incident or the other people that were affected in the fallout. Don't forget that this incident was so scandalous in part by the fact that the relationship between Kennedy and his passenger was speculated to be more than it should have been. Kennedy was married 
and his wife Joan was actually pregnant at the time of the accident. Sadly, she suffered a miscarriage and she told the wire service, I believe everything Ted said, and refused to give credit to the allegations that Kennedy and Kopechny were going for a midnight swim when the accident happened. She had said that the incident was to blame for the tragic loss of her child. This was Joan's third miscarriage. Like Joan and the late Kennedy baby she'd carried, there were a lot of what we would consider to be forgotten victims in this incident. Joan is said to have had a bit of an alcohol problem, which may have had a little to do with being the wife of a man who's rumored to have been having more than a couple extramarital affairs, on top of the pressure and whatever else comes along with simply being attached to the Kennedy family. The other women that had been present at the party were marked in their careers and personal lives with the speculation of scandal rooted from the incident, as were the other men. Not the least of the forgotten victims, I would say, is Mary Jo Kopechny, herself. Yes, her name lives in infamy, forever tied to the scandal weighing on the tail of her tragic, untimely demise. But what of her life, her accomplishments, who she was, who she could have been? All of these things fall by the wayside in the shadow of scandal and buried by silver-tongued lawyers and publicists. Mary Jo Kopechny had navigated her way into a career that was considered most fervently to be a man's world. She began her career after receiving her college education at Caldwell College for Women in Alabama. Teaching at a Montgomery Catholic school in 1963, she moved forward in her career as a secretary to Senator George A. Smathers of Florida. Only a year later, she became a speechwriter for Joseph Dolan, who was a political advisor to Robert Kennedy. She, as well as a handful of other women, had developed a serious reputation in their work on the campaign of Ted Kennedy's late brother, Robert. The Boiler Room Girls earned their nickname from the cramped, hot, windowless work area in Robert Kennedy's Washington, D.C. electoral offices, where this group of six women worked as political advisors for the 1968 presidential campaign. They have been described as, quote, frighteningly intelligent, politically astute, capable as all get out, and uniformly bright, efficient, fascinated by politics, by various sources. After Robert Kennedy's assassination, she joined Matt Reese Associates and then joined Senator Edward Kennedy's office. Her loss was a tragedy, no question. At a time when there were very few women in politics, she seemed to be on the fast track as a strong, intelligent woman to land political office. Had she survived the accident? Or had it not happened at all? Would that have alleviated the scandal in its entirety? Some say not. Ted Kennedy aside, there were rumors of a romantic tryst between she and Bobby Kennedy as she worked on his campaign prior to his untimely death. According to a 2018 article by Jerry Oppenheimer for DailyMail.com, a source who was close to the Kennedy family made a comment that Bobby came on to marry Jo. He took advantage of her trust in him and her being somewhat naive. At a minimum, there was kissing, and this was happening when she was working at Hickory Hill. Also, that Bobby's wife Ethel caught Bobby and Mary Jo in an embrace, which Bobby excused as a pat on the back for Mary Jo's good work. Also earlier, we discussed that Kopechny did not undergo an autopsy after her death, which is strange to say the least. Also, that she was buried quite quickly. There are sources, however, that say that a post-mortem exam was done, and that revelations of that exam were far more explosive. So, a lot of this information comes from reported interviews with an anonymous private investigator for the sake of her own personal protection, but I feel like it's important, as always, to present all rumors, theories, and perspectives surrounding the case and let you draw your own conclusion. Deny nothing, question everything, right? So, one of the theories floating around out there is that a man named David Powers who was apparently infamous for pulling strings to keep the Kennedys out of trouble, was with the pair in the Oldsmobile at the time of the crash, which might have been awkward if they were in fact headed for a lover's lane type scenario. But was that the case? Perhaps not. Maxine Cheshire sold what was said to be a confirmed story revealing secrets regarding the Chappaquiddick case. This article included the oh-so-scandalous allegation that Kopechny had in fact been pregnant when she and the senator drove his Oldsmobile off the dike bridge. The pregnancy was supposedly discovered in a secret post-mortem exam, of which we spoke previously. So the pregnant side chick theory brings us to speculate that perhaps this wasn't an accident at all. Which, of course, would be one of the only reasons that they would need to exclude Power's presence from the event altogether. 
This theory alludes to the possibility that Powers and Kennedy were conspiring to get rid of the scandalous pregnancy, which is why she was not only driven into the water, but left there and not reported to the police for rescue attempts for, like, ten hours. Dun-dun-dun! This is the kind of story that would blow the roof off of the Camelot legacy, which is why, sources say, the publisher got cold feet about running the story. If this was true, the story itself demonstrates the danger in compromising or crossing the Kennedy family. This wouldn't be the only one of these types of stories that mysteriously disappear. I mean, even the ABC News documentary by Geraldo Rivera in the 80s about circumstances surrounding the death of Marilyn Monroe. That is definitely a story for a different time. A different episode. Another part of our January Camelot series, of course. The point is, it wasn't uncommon for these kinds of groundbreaking, legacy-crushing stories to end up deep-sixed. There's no shortage of conspiracy and controversy lingering here, man. Man. Woman. Whoa, man. Whoa, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, while Ted Kennedy, the last of the nine, like many before him, found himself on the wrong end of one of the cardinal rules in politics, never get caught with a dead girl or a live boy. Yeah. <laughs> wow, I never heard that, but it makes so much sense. And so many people really fuck that up. They really do. It's so basic, but... Jeez, Jeez guys. Eye-opening. Earth-shattering. He still managed to salvage a career in politics, although never reaching what was likely his ultimate career goal, he would serve Massachusetts in the Senate for three more decades, being elected to his seat eight more times in 64, 70, 76, 82, 88, 94, 2000, and 2006. He came to be known as the Lion of the Senate, and with his staff wrote more than 300 bills which were enacted into law. He was a spokesman for causes including civil rights, health care, and immigration, increases to the federal minimum wage, voting rights, AIDS care, various consumer protections, and equal rights for minorities, the disabled, women, and gay Americans. In 1972, he was the driving force behind the Women, Infants, and Children's Program, or WIC program, which provides food assistance and access to health services for low-income women and their children. It is impossible for liberals or conservatives alike to say that he was not somewhat of a positive force in American government in many aspects. In May of 2008, he was diagnosed with a malignant brain tumor, but despite his poor health, he spoke at the Democratic National Convention that year, making an inspiring speech. On August 25th, 2009, at 77 years old, he succumbed to brain cancer and was buried at Arlington National Cemetery in Virginia, near the graves of his brothers John and Robert. The best way to end a semi-biographical piece, I find, is with a quote. So, to that end, the work begins anew. The hope rises again, and the dream lives on. Unless, of course, you find yourself standing in the way of the dream of someone more influential, more wealthy, and more powerful than you. Thus, we conclude this week of Bigfoot for Breakfast, and we hope you learned a thing or two, or at least got your gears grinding on a few things that you may have thought you already knew. Grind those gears. Don't forget to push the subscribe button on whichever podcast platform you're listening from. And if you're feeling super generous, please leave us a good rating and a review. And if you really want to love and support your favorite indie podcast, find us on Patreon. If you want to contact us, you can do so via email to BigfootForBreakfast at Outlook.com, Facebook message, or you can call us at 641-891-2635. Just leave us a voicemail and we'll play it on the next episode or leave a message specifying that it is a question for Mr. Weiss with the Flat Earth Society before January 15th so we can get you the answers you seek. We appreciate you listening this week and don't forget to check us out next week for the continuation of our January series on Camelot. Be sure to hit up our website and check out our merchandise shop, which is finally going live in the next couple of days by popular demand, and we bring you all the Bigfoot for Breakfast merchandise you could ever want, except for, you know, like a logo bidet, because that would be unreasonable. I'm sure we could do it. I feel like it could happen. Now I'm thinking about it. I'd love to clean your butt for you. I mean, no. With my logo. Well, I do it anyway. Jeez. Hashtag nurse life. (laughs) Thank you so much for your continued support. You're the best. And so are we. So listen and tell your friends. We're also the best. (laughs) Come at me, bro.